but you were not. And now I will leave Shane to go on stage and talk to you more about simple stuff again. How's it going, guys? Uh, that was a great talk by Maxime um, about like the low-level graphic stack and how we um, simplified that. And I'm gonna expand on that more on like the, the Raylib part, like how we turned, um, how we, um, yeah. So <laughs> let's just start. So solving simplicity again. Uh, it's my idea that if you uh, if you have simple code, and yeah, this goes both ways. If you have simple code, you can have a nice simple life. So yeah. Nice, beautiful servers here. You can uh, go surf and surfing after this. Great. So, sorry to jump scare everybody so early in the morning. I know if you get this in your, uh, you know, email, uh, pull request closed by Deeb, that can be scary. But, um, yeah, before I started working at Kama, I was just a college student, and whenever I wanted to work on a project, a coding project, I, I didn't have um, any like idea of making things simple. I uh, just hacked together the first, you know, the first solution that worked and I moved on and maybe I came back months later and it was like totally impossible to reason about this code. Like it's just way too big. You can't keep it all in your head at once and that's why you need to uh, try to keep things simple. So how, how do we recognize whenever we're, we're adding complexity where we, we don't need to? And that's recognition. You need to be self-aware enough to realize in the moment when you're doing this stuff. Uh, one case is Let's say you're, you're adding something to the UI and you want to add an edge case. You want to support, like maybe a user gets in those weird, you know, we want to show like an error message for this specific one case and that adds 30 lines. Well, 20 lines. Or maybe you're adding a feature that you don't really need. Maybe you're making something abstract. You just want to add one feature, but you're like, oh, maybe in the future we want to do this other thing. So we, we make it generic and that's just extra complexity that you don't need yet. And... Well, that, that looks good, that, that looks good, right? We're removing a thousand lines. However, this is a tricky case because you're using a library and while that can be good sometimes, I'm gonna explore why that might not be. So we going, we're going back, I think eight years or so, back to 2016, oh, whoops. Um, we had, we were basically running like um, a souped up Android phone, it was like the Comet Eon at the time, and we had a few APKs that we ran one was, it was just black. It just drew a black frame for some reason. I think that was to hide the boot splash whenever we switched between the different UIs. One was the frame, so like when you're on road, if it's green or, or not, like if you're engaged or not. One was the off-road UI, so you could like swipe, uh, you could like swipe and see your uh, driving stats, whatnot, pair your device. And I didn't know this, but apparently we had Spotify and Waze, um, which I, if you have CarPlay, I don't know why you need that. Maybe this is before CarPlay, but I guess you could just pair it to your Bluetooth. And then on top of that, to draw the, like, the lane lines of the model, we had a different graphic stack called Nano VG, which is written in C. It's actually quite simple. Um, so that was probably the best part of this stack. But you can see this is a lot of like working parts together, right? So a few years ago, we switched to a new stack, which is, whoa, I think there's some lag up here. That's QT. And Qt is a nice uh, graphics library at the time to switch off of, or to, to switch to, because it supports widgets. You know, if you want to like put some text, um, or if you want to like you know enter your password for your Wi-Fi, it, it's just all there. It's all coded for you. Um, it has nice uh, multi-language support. And if we go back to the graph there, if you saw, there was just way too much to, to reason about. You need a graph. Let's see if this works here. But anyway, you, you need a graph to like see the whole state of QT. You can see you have like a tree widget. I don't even know what the hell half of this stuff is, but it's there and this is probably just like a small subset of QT. So this is the, the problem with using libraries sometimes. They, they do remove code. They do you know, put the complexity out of your project. However, the problem is that you have to trust that this other developer, you know, they didn't write bugs writing all this complex code. So, if we can switch here, there it is. So complexity is a black box. And I'm, I'm gonna briefly explain like a few cases we ran into while um, writing the new UI in Qt. Um, so basically, the driving model 
uh, for experimental mode, it like draws a path and it just like um, it's green if it wants to accelerate, red if it wants to break, right? So we, we have this nice hue, which is a float, but for some reason I found that if you don't round the float from another float to a slightly different float, it would take two times longer to draw, to draw the path, and I just never figured it out. I just ended up rounding it, which somehow worked, which is great, but it's just, com uh, just complexity. Uh, and complexity is a black box, right? And so uh, black boxes require care. Another issue I ran into, um, so just one day, the, the Jenkins test, the hardware in the loop test, just started failing out of nowhere uh, for high UI timings. And if you can see over there, it might be a little faint, but just some frames will take up to 300 milliseconds to render where they should normally be under like 10 or 20. And while I was debugging this issue live, the lights in the open pilot office turned off and the timings that I was seeing just like spiked. So what was actually happening was the model was just um, on the Comma 3X was pointed against the wall and it's basically either seeing light or dark. So when the light turned off, it was just outputting lane line geometries that were just totally, uh, not totally wrong, but it just the, the polygon renderer just couldn't convert it into like a nice uh, triangle strip that the GPU could run. And it was just using this entirely different code path that it just doesn't tell you that it's doing in the moment. Um, so that took a while to figure out. So how do, we, how do we fix this? Well, as Maxime talked about earlier, we switched off Qt to Raylib, which is just like a simple OpenGL wrapper. It gives you a few functions, like you can just draw uh, shapes and text. The, uh, the entirety of Qt, I think, I looked it up last night, it's like several million lines of code. And we just have uh, a widget function ourselves, which is 200 lines of code. So that's, you know, that's a huge improvement. If you want to draw a nice icon, it just takes four lines right there. Uh, there's no dependencies, there's no build time. So what used to take a minute, if you want to change a UI component, is now instant. It's infinitely faster. And yeah, just who wants to fix other people's bugs, right? That's cringe. So how did we fix the original problem where the model was just outputting like lane line geometry that the Qt didn't know how to handle? You can just simply do less. So you can see Qt has this huge 3,000 line function just to triangulate uh, polygons. And they might be like inverted or convex or whatever. And we don't need to support any of that. We just need a simple four line for loop. That's all you need. And it's way, super, it's way simpler, it's consistent. So yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the, like, the practical applications of switching to a smaller library where you can control the complexity yourself and you can remove the bugs yourself, which is very nice. So switching gears to uh, the car interfacing, uh, I think it's, it's really cool how we support over 300 cars now, and that's growing every single day, right? And a lot of the car support comes from contributors like you guys, which is also really cool. Um, but you know, there's like th there could be there could be a lot of complexity in that, right? You have to support like all the different Hyundai's support different harness like physical harness types, and as well as the software, the DVCs can be different per car. So how how do we handle that? That seems like an impossible problem. Well, to give you guys some context, last year we had a daemon con controls D. And it pretty much does, you know, what you expect. Uh, it takes in CAN data from the car, runs it through the car interface suite, which is basically like where's the steering angle and the gas and brakes. Run it through, run it, uh, runs it through some controllers. So like based on the model, should it turn left or right right now or accelerate? And then it outputs it back to the car. And however, Controls D also did a bunch of other stuff like. It ran the state machine, like if you're pressing the brake, should it disengage right now? Or if the model is uncertain or if you're doing a lane change. So it's just doing a lot of stuff. This is pretty complex. Um, to keep the whole file in your head is just also impossible. So what we did, and is, this seems pretty simple now, but this is how it was for eight plus years or so. We just took the car stuff out of OpenPilot, which where it was all together. We moved it to a new project called OpenDBC, where the car can, uh, the DBC messages already existed, so it's just, all in one place, which is really nice. And OpenDBC, uh, what I just discussed, is a self-contained package that you can pip install right now. You can run all the tests. You can import all the cars. Um, this wasn't possible before with OpenPilot. Um, we're trying to make that nice and pip installable, but soon. 
So what OpenDBC does is it provides like a very small API that OpenPilot can um, take and it can read data from the car, it can send actuation messages to the car. But again, what this allowed us to do is look at this API and see, oh, what is this message that we're reverse engineering for every single car? All we need to know is if the user is pressing the gas, but we're also reverse engineering how much they're pressing the gas, which you don't really need in terms of the, uh, the state management. You just need to stop applying the brakes. So remove that field, and that's just one less thing that people have to reverse engineer now. And then also the one minute CI, as Maxime talked about, that was a requirement, and it was pretty easy. Um, there was like eight different tests for OpenPilot and just adding these onto it. It's just, um, just it's nice to have that separated. So one of the, the improvements that the smaller API allowed us to make was add a new tool called the longitudinal, longitudinal uh, maneuver report. And that's something, that's a toggle built into OpenPilot. You can go into your settings, turn that on. And basically, before this, if you wanted to test longitudinal tuning improvements, you had to like, especially late at night, you have to find a lead car, maybe at a stoplight, and you have to engage behind them, hope that they don't leave or run the red light so you can like get a nice um, like stopping profile. And then you, you feel like, oh, d d d did that feel good? Um, did, it over, like, did it overshoot on the brakes, whatever? But now we can recreate real scenarios. Uh, let's see. Ooh, laser pointer. So gas brake, gas brake. You can see the Camry is overshooting on the brakes a little bit, uh, undershooting and then overshooting on the gas. Corolla looks like it overshoots a whole lot. The EV6 is pretty good. So this just allows to quantify the actual performance of the different cars that we support. And what that allows, to do, allows us to do is we can make like very targeted changes to the tuning. So if we want to improve the gas response on Toyota, help that not overshoot as much, we can make, that, we can make those changes and rerun that part of the report and see that uh, if it improves it, if it makes no change or not. And it's really cool because you can see some of these are user reports. So you want to run this tool, again, it's just in your settings. And you can upload the data to this website right here. And maybe somebody will tune your car if you can't. And one improvement from that, so this is this like the simplicity thing, like Maxime said, it all goes full circle. So you have this, you have this API that you make smaller because you're you're reasoning about it now. You're trying to make it simpler. Then you build this tool to use that new API, and now you can actually merge improvements based on that. So a contributor in 2020 found this bit in the uh, reverse engineered DBC for Toyota that improves the gas response. However, it also disables braking and it makes it overshoot sometimes. So we didn't merge it until uh, just this year. Yeah, I think just this year. And that was because of the report that we had. So on the Corolla, starting from a stop, it took up to, looks like, more than four seconds to move. And now, after we, we tested the bit, we can actually see that it follows the uh, acceleration request much, much more, uh, much better. So yeah, if anything, um, if, you had, if you found any of this interesting, you can port your new car, you can help us make the API simpler. You can also get paid if you go to the Bounties website, which is really nice. So my final message is if you too can simplify your code, maybe one day you can merge your PR and a deed will approve it. <laughs> Thank you.